Welcome to the Ready Podcast. I'm Rebecca Riley, Associate Professor at City Ready, WM Ready, University of Birmingham. In our first series of podcasts, we'll be looking at megatrends in the West Midlands. WM Ready has developed evidence examining the impacts of COVID-19 on the West Midlands region by producing economic impact monitors and a state of the region report with policy partners. The WMCA commissioned further work to look at the megatrends identified in the State of the Region 2020 report. This process has highlighted potential for the acceleration of existing trends by the COVID-19 crisis, culminating in new scenarios for future economic activity, life and places. Some examples of megatrends we explored include business models and operations, work and training, future health and green spaces, local living, changing city centre business districts, just cities, generational conflict, urban responses and economic shocks, future mobility and tactical urbanism. There is a gap in policymakers' understanding of whether these trends will continue, altering the structure of society and businesses in the longer term. These podcasts and the larger programme of work it's part of will help us explore selected trends and scenarios with policymakers locally and nationally in more depth, helping them formulate economic recovery policy, which takes account of these changes. The scenarios identified could have significant economic consequences and scarring effects for vulnerable groups and places as a result of impacts on human, social, physical and natural capital. This research examines these impacts and trends, developing future scenarios in greater depth in order to identify, along with policymakers, those policies which may be more effective in restarting the economy, encouraging recovery, and creating long-term renewal by encouraging positive trends and mitigating negative effects. I hope you enjoy the series, and for a more detailed look at megatrends, please download and read the associated provocations and report on the topic, Megatrends in the West Midlands. Welcome to the City Ready podcast. In a series of podcasts, we will be examining megatrends in the West Midlands. Megatrends are major movements, patterns or trends that have transformative impact on business, economy, society, cultures, and personal lives. This episode will be looking at transport in the West Midlands. We'll be discussing key trends, impacts, and opportunities for West Midlands cities. I am Dr. Magda Cepeda Zorrilla, Research Fellow at City Ready, University of Birmingham. And today we'll be talking to Mike Waters, Director of Policy, Strategy and Innovation, Transport for West Midlands. Thank you for joining us, Mike. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization? Yeah, sure. Um, we're uh, the Transport Authority or represent the Transport Authority for the West Midlands conurbation. That's about uh, 3 million people covering the, the cities, Coventry, Birmingham, Wolverhampton and, and the other boroughs and districts in the area. Um, and my team has uh, the privilege of, of attempting to, to set a coherent policy and strategy for the region for transport that integrates with land use and energy and digital and, and so on. Thank you very much, Mike. I would like to, to start the, the, this, this nice chat just a little bit about the challenges that transport uh, for West Mid- Mid- Midlands is facing in terms of the potential emptying of the cities after the coronavirus pandemic. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, is there a, a, a trend in terms of home working? Um, is this equal uh, in opportunities for everyone in the region? I mean, home working is, is clearly a, a thing um, and, and it's a significant uh, change to the way people are are living, but we do need to remember that home working only applies to a proportion of the employed community, and they themselves are actually only a small proportion of the overall travelling community. So, to three million people, commuting is not actually our biggest transport headache. It's not the main reason for car or passenger travel. Freight and logistics is is a huge part of that. What we've seen with remote working is a massive increase in e-commerce and with that freight and logistics movements. 
and trips to and from our strategic towns and centres only actually account for about 15% of all trip making. So the majority of trip making anyway isn't to or from the centres. It's it's actually in the, the suburban and, and orbital movements for the communities where it has had a really significant impact with with the home working is in the centres where the public transport network is is heavily geared in commerciality of the public transport network, bus, uh, metro and rail is all geared around serving the centres. And that is what has been disproportionately hit. So we've seen some real challenges to the the economics and the economic viability of public transport. And and that then has a knock on on effect on overall behaviours. Even though we are out of the pandemic, there's still some remaining, you know, I don't know, like uh, issues happening about the the people still getting sick. So I, I would like to hear what, what is the Transport for West Midlands doing in, in terms of ensuring uh, people's safety in, in the public transport? I mean, the, f the first thing, I suppose, is the fact that actually it is perfectly safe to travel on public transport, you know, and actually that's been there's been limited evidence that actually it was riskier. So it was much more of a public perception piece. I think what we, we're seeing a slight challenge on now is because many, particularly we're seeing this on the train services, because in response to the pandemic, uh, in, in essentially a, a quasi-nationalised rail network now as, as the government has taken over the, the specification of rail timetables, We've seen a reduction in in services and a reduction in in the amount of rolling stock actually out there, and what we're actually seeing now is some quite strong overcrowding on a number of these services, which I th think doesn't help people feel comfortable that reversion to to very overcrowded services. In the rest of the public transport network, we're inherently more able to flex up. So so you know the the bus services are. Are, are growing to accommodate demand. We've seen bus services back up to over 80% of, of pre-COVID travel. Um, and, and so actually, I think the perception isn't actually borne out by what we're, we're observing with behaviours on the ground. But generally, we're obviously communicating that people should just remain respectful of one another. And this just goes back to, to a constant running campaign we have where uh, thankfully the vast majority of people are, are respectful and, and kind and courteous to each other but obviously you get the odd incidents and that stands out so we're just working with colleagues across all of our transport operators to to reassure people and, and be there to help them mm -hmm. well that's very very important this actually connects a lot with something i wanted to ask you uh, what can can be done in the in the West Midlands to to uh, help to reduce this this travel and uh, these journeys to work and um, how about the case of the fifteen minute city for example or the twenty minutes neighborhood that now is been you know a lot in the news in France and other other cities in Europe what is uh, what are the views for, for, for from the region uh, in terms of of achieving maybe something like that here. Oh, we've been looking at this really closely with with our partner authorities, the city authorities, and, and and local authorities. We actually think it does have terrific potential. One of the reasons I think, as a concept, it's exciting is it it starts to break some of the traditional silos that transport has operated within to really start to look at that community area in a more cohesive way, looking at what you need for a sustainable neighbourhood, um, that bridges over into what services are available for the local community, how viable is it for people to go about and live their lives and interact with their built environment in that local 15-minute area. And actually, I think there's there's a lot that's got to, to kind of happen to make that a genuinely viable proposition. I think through the lockdowns, people have actually had their eyes open in many cases to the possibilities of the social and, and personal benefits of living more locally. 
I think there's a slight difference when we talk about a 15-minute city, but obviously by definition you're kind of focusing on the centre there. And the change we probably need to see to make that a reality is actually increasing the densification of living in the centre. And with that comes some, some land use changes. So whilst we might see less office-born activity in the centres, uh, what we need to see is an evolution of that retail model being less about serving workers in their lunch times and their breaks and drinks after 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 work's finished to much more of a rounded uh, living environment with with the entertainment and and so on working in the centers but the really big opportunity from a transport perspective going back to the fact that most our trips occur outside the main centers is actually looking then at those local centres, those local suburban areas, and working out what services, what facilities need to go in to make those genuinely sustainable 15-minute communities. So this is much about what we're doing for, for local services and facilities. Practically, things like mobility hubs, parcel lockers, more access to things like bike hire, even e-scooters, micro-mobility, all of these initiatives I think can help people, but they need to be linked into a very much community-led initiative where, where we've got that mix with the local retailers and, and the services and the social services all need to come together in one coherent plan. Practically as well, just basic stuff with with low traffic neighborhoods uh, trying to get some of that permeability that a lot of the suburban area was built in discrete sort of housing estates and and actually can be quite hard to go what might only be a few hundred meters as the crow flies but you just can't make that walk you almost have to get in your car and drive out of one housing estate and go around the arterial road network to drive into the next one but the end-to-end -end journey was probably only a few hundred meters apart. Um, and so there's some real challenges in the built environment about kind of building in that, that permeability, reallocating space to support more community space, more mobility hub space, and actually make that walk and cycle thing feel a lot safer and more, more sustainable. Well, that's just really, really interesting. And, and I entirely agree with you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned about a community-led initiative. Um, the, the Transport for West Midlands was recently awarded with 17 million government grant for active travel. I was wondering if there is a, an initiative for, you know, uh, kind of uh, supporting this community co-designing in policy and co-design in the changes for maybe uh, the 15-minute city uh, or the 20-minute, uh, if possible. Is in this grant consider allocating funding for that more community uh, interaction well we've we've been really fortunate in the west midlands it's um it's, it's thankfully not just the 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 active travel fund which we've been successful in securing money for we are in the process of securing quite a chunk of money into uh, the, the public transport environment through the bus service improvement plan and there's There's 90 million of revenue support coming into the region over the next few years on that. And then there's a, a, another billion plus pounds coming into the region for, for wider transport infrastructure, which also includes a good chunk of active travel, walking, cycling, public transport, road space reallocation, and, and, and the, the basics of just maintaining the highway network. So, Over the next five years, we've actually got a, a huge capital program to, to bring to bear. At the heart of all of that is actually engaging and, and making sure we're really clear that for each scheme, there is that high quality community engagement. That's, that's a clear objective for the region and, and a condition of the funding. I think actually the big conversation is wrapped up with a parallel thing where we've been refreshing the statutory local transport plan. So this is the plan uh, that has some, some genuine legal weight that sets out what the region is seeking to achieve with its transport network overall. And we've been consulting on that, that consultation. That was a, the consultation draft was approved earlier this year and we've not long 
closed the public consultation on that and are analysing the results. But that sets out six big moves. And one of those big moves is is all around behaviour change and is all about a dialogue with the with the three million people that transport needs to serve in the region to try and understand better what they need to change in order to get more from from their built environment, which helps us on this journey towards a, a viable 15-minute sustainable neighbourhood. And what we are clear on, whilst we can invest a lot and are going to invest a lot in the infrastructure, just building the infrastructure alone is not going to be sufficient to elicit the kind of scale of behaviour change that we need if the region, and indeed this is a a reflection of a wider challenge that the whole country has got, but if the region is to respond to the big challenges of climate change, decarbonisation of the transport system, addressing some of those social inequities around who has access to opportunity and there's an inequity in terms of the impact as well of some people's travel behaviours on, on the other communities. So generally, the poorer communities that are faced with the biggest social challenges are also the ones that are most adversely impacted by the negative impacts of a, a, an excess reliance on the car, which we see. You know, We're looking for a transport system that... that, that meets the challenge of the, the behaviour change required for climate change and, and all of this, that requires a huge, huge step change in the way that we all interact and behave with our built environment and in particular make those travel choices. This is this is not a, a build it and they should come. If we put we do need to put a lot more into the cycle network, we do need to make the footways a lot better. All of that will happen. That alone is not enough to make people feel confident to make those big changes about the way they choose to live and and get around their environment. Um, So, yeah, we're going to have to challenge as a region. We're going to have to embrace some quite, quite deep challenges, I think and want to do that willingly. Individually, uh, the the changes in in, in behavior, um, about not driving in those short journeys if you can avoid driving. I mean, you can improve your health by just walking a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mike, I want to ask you uh, something something uh, interesting now regarding actually this reduction of car use. How can can it be compatible reduce, redu- reducing car use when we also want to reduce CO2 emissions by introducing electric cars. What are your views on this? How, how, what is Transport for West Midlands' um, position regarding electric cars and car reduction? Because I see a little bit of imbalance. Uh, you know, if you want to reduce car use, then reduce car use. But then introducing electric cars to reduce emissions, it doesn't really help in terms of, of reducing uh, congestion and, and, and other contaminants and pollutants from the cars, not only CO2. I mean... We've got to do several things at once, and they're not incompatible. Um, It is clear we need to rapidly electrify the transport system as a whole. So that's not just cars, it's the bus network, um, all all modes. Um, And obviously, provided that electrification agenda, or if it's hydrogen, we've got a big hydrogen initiative as well, but provided that the, the fuel source can be generated sustainably from green sources, um, then clearly that helps both the emissions at the point of use and and air quality is a huge issue in the dense urban area with profound health impacts. So if you can remove the emissions at the point of use, that has a direct and immediate benefit on the health of, of residents in the area because the air quality improves and that that's a massive factor but also it is is helping the decarbonization provided that energy source is green notwithstanding that you're quite correct the overall shift in behavior change means that we do need to become less reliant on private singularly occupied vehicles irrespective of the 
the drive chain and and the, the source of energy in those. At the moment, we have an excess of reliance on on that with you know, mode share of nearly seventy percent uh, private car. Um, and I think there's quite a few things we can do that are not incompatible with electrifying the transport system. So opening that up to mean that for many journey circumstances, a car will remain necessary and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But can that journey be shared with somebody? Do you need to own that car? Because ownership tends to drive a, well, I've got it, I'll use it every day. But actually... The cost, the, t- the total cost of ownership for a, for a vehicle that is an, actually sat unused on the drive or on the road for well over 90% of its life. Over 90% of the time that you own that thing, you are not using it. And yet that costs a huge amount to the household. And that money could actually be better utilized for the benefit of the household. It could be going into the local economy. Um, as opposed to to going into to a global vehicle supply chain, uh, actually having access to a car club, being able to just hire a car, maybe use a taxi instead on that one occasion, instead of being locked into ownership. And one of the things we're aware is, and one of the challenges with the electrification agenda is the first movers, the early adopters of, of, of electrified vehicles, tend to be the more affluent. These are more expensive vehicles at the moment. There's a barrier to entry for ownership. And yet many of the cars in the park, the cars out there in the being used on the road at the moment, are actually the older cars that are owned and run by households for whom that total cost of running that vehicle is a disproportionate amount of their, their overall disposable income. And so I think there's a real need to help move away from this model of needing to own a vehicle, which isn't to demonize using a car. A car will remain absolutely essential. If you've got to go and pick up your your gran and she's got mobility issues and you've then got to go and fit the shopping in and pick up kids from two different schools and really complex, well, a car is probably going to remain an entirely appropriate and reasonable Use and, and we would want people to have access to a car when they need access to a car. But actually, that doesn't necessarily need to be the need every single day of the week. And so some days of the week, you can take the bus instead or the kids can get a lift with a friend or a neighbor or whatever it is. It works for your life. What we're trying to introduce is more flexibility, more choice to give people more realistic and viable options so, which is why we've bought things like the bike hire, the e-scooters, flexible ticket pricing. So you get a best value guarantee on your public transport trip. You can buy a cohort and then use those and be guaranteed of the best value fares. Um, uh, and something we're bringing forward, which has got the most awful name, but it's called Mobility as a Service, which is can be thought of a bit like Netflix for transport or, or whatever, where you can consume whatever is the appropriate choice of transport on demand against one single account. So you could be a taxi one day, it could be hiring a car the next, it could be the bus for the next two days, and then it might be walking and cycling. And that that menu of choice is made much easier and accessible without you needing to own the car and then pay that excess overhead for owning it and then not using it for over 90% of the time. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. Definitely having a car just parked there, is, it becomes a burden for the families and in the domestic economy. Um, hopefully we can see these changes. Maybe before we, we finish, I would like to ask you if you could think of a time frame, maybe a short term, medium term, long term, when, when, when can we see changes for, for better in terms of active travel and behavioral change. I, I know you don't have all, um, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, the future, but if in your views, um, what do you think is the time frame for, for seeing changes uh, more towards uh, um, sustainable transportation and sustainable way of, of living in the West Midlands? 
I mean, we've we've come a long way already in a short period of time in the region where sort of for the last 20 or so years, you know, prior to the, the combined authority being formed, um, there was relatively little investment going in or strategic investment into the system. What what we've already seen is extending that tram network, opening rail stations. Um, we've seen quite a lot of investment secured and gone into to cycling already. Of course, that's that's only the start. Uh, the next five years is going to see this this huge excess of, of uh, a billion pounds invested uh, doubling the, the bus network. Um, yeah, loads is going to be safe to stay in touch. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's been really wonderful having this conversation with you and share it with everybody um, here in the City Ready podcast. No problem. I enjoyed it. 